Good afternoon. Welcome to today's webinar, Slips, Trips, and Falls, The Human Factors and Engineering Principles. Slips, Trips, and Falls continue to be one of the most prevalent causes of injuries sustained by humans. In the U.S., about 12 million people annually are injured seriously enough from falls to require at least one day of restricted activity for medical attention. Each year, over 1 million people, people are treated in hospital emergency rooms after being injured from a fall on floors, landing, stairs, and ramps, resulting in over 6,000 deaths. The elderly are especially susceptible to falling. 75% of those who die from a fall are 65 years of age or older. The financial cost can be staggering as well. It is reported that in New York City, over $560 million was paid out in claims for slip, trips, and fall accidents in 2010 alone. When slip, trip, and fall events occur, an engineering analysis and human factors expert can assist in understanding the mechanisms of the slip, trip, and fall and the factors that led to the slip, trip, and fall event. This webinar will take some of the confusion out of a slip, trip, and fall and clarify what really occurred when an alleged slip, trip, and fall event has taken place. Specifically, during this afternoon's program, our presenters will cover the following. What classifies as a slip, trip, and fall event? Where most slip, trip, and fall hazards are likely to exist? What human factors techniques can be applied to evaluating slip, trip, and fall events? The biomechanics of a slip, trip, and fall event? The role of aging and other factors on slip, trip, and fall events? strategy to help prevent slip, trip, and fall events, various standards that attempt to address slip, trip, and falls, and various testing devices that can be used to evaluate the potential for a slip, trip, and fall. The presenters for today's program are Phil Buckley and Mark Heidebrick. Phil and Mark have collaborated on numerous cases providing engineering, accident reconstruction, human factors, and biomechanical expertise with determining causation of a slip, trip, and fall event. Mr. Buckley has a Master's of Mechanical Engineering degree and is registered and is a registered professional engineer. Mark Heidebrick is, a, is board certified by the American College of Sports Medicine and the Board of Certified Professional Ergonomics. Combined, they have over 60 years' experience in the field of engineering, accident reconstruction, biomechanics, and human factors analysis. These two experts will speak about slip, trips, and falls, and how you can benefit from their collaboration and experience. We'll take three question and answer breaks during today's program. If you have a question, please use the chat or Q&A feature located on the right-hand side of the screen to submit your questions. We encourage all attendees to submit questions throughout the presentation. Tomorrow morning, I will send out the link to the archive recording of this program. And we do ask that you take time to call the survey that will appear on your screen after the webinar is over. And I invite you to sit back, relax, and enjoy. We're going to turn the program over to our distinguished presenters, Phil Buckley and Mark Heidberg. Phil and Mark, the program is all yours. Thank you, Matt. Um, for that very nice introduction. This is Mark, and uh, Phil and I would like to welcome, welcome all of you to today's uh, presentation. We appreciate the opportunity to present a very timely topic for you today, slips, trips, and falls. We know that you are busy, and in one hour it's not possible to cover this complex topic in tremendous detail. So we have developed this webinar to hit just highlights of the problem and possible solutions. This webinar is part of a series that we have developed for tasks to dealing with common human factor issues such as medical errors, driver distraction, and workplace safety. Slips, trips, and falls in a, is a year-round problem. However, with winter um, rapidly approaching, and if you're located in New England and um, you've already experienced this in a, in a big way, uh, it takes on a particular problem for commercial businesses. Human Tech has over 22 uh, years of history working with attorneys, insurance companies, and corporate clients, and approximately 15 years working with fine folks at TASA. 
The three main areas of focus for our 30 plus engineers, scientists, and technical professionals are consulting, product development, and litigation support. Our consultants have worked in approximately 48 of the 50 states, including Hawaii and Alaska. And between Phil and myself, we have combined 60 years of experience in engineering, human factors, and biomechanics. Today, we'd like to share some of that expertise and knowledge with you. The format of this webinar is uh, very informal, as Max explained, so please submit any questions that you have. If we don't know the answer, we'll be glad to get back with you um, when, we get, when we do find that answer. So sit back, relax, and we'll get, get started here. Today, we'll discuss slips, trips, and fall statistics. We'll define what constitutes a slip, trip, or fall. We'll discuss how to measure and analyze slips, trips, and falls and review applicable standards. We'll discuss some causes of slips, trips, and falls, which include both physical characteristics and human factor aspects as well. And we'll conclude with a brief discuss discussion on preventive techniques. In 2007, more than um, 21,700 Americans died as a result of falls, and more than 7.9 million Americans were injured by falling. In the year 2000, direct medical costs for fall injuries totaled $19 billion. Falls are the leading cause of injury-related death among those 73 years old and older. And more than one-third of people 65 years old and older fall each year. And those who fall are two, to three, uh, are two to three times more likely to fall again. According to 2009 data from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, 605 workers were killed and over 212,000 workers were seriously injured by falls to the same level or to a lower level. The highest number of fall-related fatalities was experienced in the construction industry. However, the highest number of non-fatal fall injuries were found in health services, wholesale, and retail industries, with health care being number one. The incident rate of lost workday injuries from slip trips and falls on the same level in hospitals was 38.2 per 10,000 employees. This is 90% greater than the average rate for all other industry, all other private industries rather combined. Slip trips and falls are the second most common cause of lost workdays in hospitals, and that's second only to musculoskeletal disorders. Before we, dis before we begin discussing slip trips and falls, it is important to set the stage by explaining some biomechanical principles of walking. So what do we consider normal walking pattern or gait, since slipping, tripping, or falling is a deviation from this norm? Well, walking is actually a very complex locomotor, locomotor activity. However, it should be remembered that this activity is learned prior to the time we have permanent memory, so therefore is it is not a highly conscious activity, and it is not common for a person to observe his or her walking behavior. Some have defined walking as controlled fall. Every time you take a step, you lean forward and fall slightly, and you are caught by your outstretched foot. After, you, after the foot touches the ground, your body weight transfers to it, and your knee bends to absorb the shock. The front leg then lifts the body and propels it forward as the rear leg swings up to catch up with, up with you, and the cycle repeats. If one of these steps fails to occur in just the right order with specific timing, a fall can occur. There are two primary mechanical phases of walking, stance and swing. The stance phase is broken down into an additional four phases. Heel strike 
to foot flat, foot flat through mid stance, mid stance through heel off, and heel off to toe off. During each of these phases, very complex biomechanical events occur. The stance phase comprises 60% of the gait cycle, where the swing phase accounts for only 40%. Now let's define a slip, trip, misstep, or fall. A slip results when one or both feet or the base of support such as a cane, crutch, or walker slides across the support surface. Sliding occurs when there is inefficient friction force between the support surface and the ground or floor. A slip can occur when the heel strikes the ground, the front of the heel slips, the lateral sole slip, the main sole slip, or when the toe slips. A trip occurs when the ground, uh, when a near ground obstacle abruptly stops a portion of the support base which causes center gravity to shift quickly. A common type of trip involves catching the front of the shoe which stops the supporting base as the individual center gravity continues forward. A misstep typically occurs when an individual steps onto a surface that is a different height than what they perceive. This can cause an unexpected shift in the individual's center of gravity, which must be compensated for by a sudden compensatory movement to regain balance. A fall results when a person is not able to maintain balance over the center of gravity and or the center of gravity shifts outside the individual's base of support and gravity takes over. A fall can result from a slip, trip, or misstep that can also occur independently. Common hazards which can lead to slip, trips, and falls include wet or contaminated floors, for example, grease, liquids, ice, oil, dust, and fine powders, and such. Uneven walking surfaces, such as holes or broken glass or um, uh, broken or loose tiles, defective or wrinkled carpet or mats or uneven steps or thresholds. Obstruction in the walkway, such as hoses, cords, cables, um, can lead to slip strips and falls. Or unguarded elevated uh, platforms or walkways. And in inadequate illumination or lighting um, or lighting that disguises um, with shadows can also be a hazard. Uh, that concludes our, our first short section, and uh, we'll entertain any questions that uh, individuals might might have here. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Mark. We do have a, a couple questions that have come into us. Uh, Jennifer asks, why is the incidence of slip, trip, and fall so much higher in hospitals? Um, I think there are, there are probably numerous, um, as with many slip, trips, and falls, numerous root causes to that. Um, but uh, hospitals is a place where you can have fluids um, on the floor. I think one of the things that makes hospitals susceptibly vulnerable is you have um, lots of different people coming in and out of, of rooms, which may or may not take responsibility for, um, for cleaning up um, potential hazards. Um, and also the um, footwear um, also can present a, a hazard as well um, for um, for people that work there as well as individuals who may be may be injured and that actually brings up another um, another point in that um, some of the, some injuries can occur by individuals who may be in the hospital for balance issues um, uh, you know uh, dizziness lightheadedness those types of things which um, uh, take take proper medical care to avoid um, avoid hazards, which is fall, basically a, another aspect of ergonomic significant factors, which is uh, fall prevention. Okay, excellent. And Mark and Phil, we've had some independents who have said that you seem a little distant, so if you could, I guess, either speak up or get a little closer to the microphone, um, it might help some people hear a little bit better. Um, we'll do our best there. That, that's a lot better, Mark. Um, 
And here's another question from Alan who asks, do most slips and falls in hospitals occur um, to employees, patients, or visitors? Um, you know, I'd have to go back and look at the statistics on that. I'm not sure I particularly recall. Typically, the um, the reason for the slip strips and falls can can be um, well the, nu numerous um, and and different for each of those groups. Um, visitors may not be aware of uh, many hospital rooms will have um, uh, cords and um, and, and things on the ground for equipment that may be in the room that a visitor may not be aware of, or maybe a healthcare worker that works in the in the um, room is. Whereas um, the um, the um, patient actually it may be well, they may actually have the same same hazards present, but there may may be due to a um, physical physical ability such as the medications or a um, uh, disease process or um, uh, lightheadedness, as mentioned before. And I'm going to chime in on that. I'll, I'll say that I, in my experience, uh, the uh, potential for injury is split about equally between patients and workers. Uh, you have uh, an environment which is, and also visitors, you have an environment which is uh, unusual un, uh, for the visitors coming in. They don't know what the environment is like. Uh, the uh, floors in most hospitals are... Uh, pretty well designed, but they can be slippery, and they're almost always uh, not very well textured. So they have a higher slip uh, potential than a lot of uh, floors that we're used to. Uh, and as Mark pointed out earlier, you've got a lot of cords, blankets, towels, unusual things, and, and, and in certain circumstances, you have a lot of people in a small area, which can contribute. The, um, the numbers that I gave earlier were specific to healthcare workers. Um, and did not take into account the, um, the statistics, did not take into account visitors and um, and actually patients that would, um, that was, that the statistics were specific to healthcare workers. Hey, great. We have one final question, and then we'll move on to the presentation of content. James asks, does it matter which direction the fall occurs, to the front or to the back? Um, I, I guess does it matter in regard? It, it can matter in regard to, um, I guess, mechanism of injury, and it can also matter in regard to the injuries that are sustained. Um, um, so yeah, it, it does matter. Um, in fact, you can have um, lateral lateral slips, um, which is to, which would. Um, potentially um, impose a, a, a fall to the side, um, and you can have a, a trip forward and back, um, and um, each have it, has its own um, uniqueness as far as how the individual tries to compensate for that and recovery mechanism. Okay, excellent. Well, thank you so much. Let's continue on with the presentation of content. All right, so uh, this is Phil, and I'm switching over here with Mark so that I can run the uh, equipment. And uh, I will use the uh, pointer in my presentation, which is going to deal with uh, mechanics. Uh, so I'll try to identify certain aspects. So thank you very much, Matt. My responsibility today is to explain the mechanical aspects of measurement and then to discuss the standards that apply or some of the standards that apply to slip strips and falls. But I have to admit to having been injured in all three modes myself, so I hope to give you a heartfelt sense of the human side of the situation as well. For instance, just two weeks ago, I was resurrected my 10-speed bicycle and I went for a ride. Coasting out of the driveway, I fell over in the street and skinned my knee. The chain had gotten jammed between the sprocket and the frame, and it would not move. And while I was trying to figure this out, gravity took over. More about that later. So nearly everyone has been injured by a slip, trip, or fall, and they are one of the most common incidences occurring to human beings, as Mark has adequately pointed out. Often you realize what is going on just after it started, but while it's occurring, and there's not much you can do. And it's really easy to say, oh, I lost my grip or my foot slipped, implying that low friction was the cause or the surface was just too slick. But was it, and how do we know? Well, we measure it using standard techniques.
Uh, it's often said, in fact, I got off my slide there, it's often said that about standards, the nice thing, the nice thing is that there are so many to choose from. One report, the report indicates that there are over 90 devices for measuring friction uh, that have been developed in the last 100 years. So what is friction and how do you talk about it? Well, my simple two-arrow diagram or cartoon on this slide shows the two parts of friction. The larger down arrow, arrow depicts the weight of an object, and the horizontal side arrow depicts the maximum force that is available to keep the object from sliding sideways. The simple ratio of the horizontal force to the down force is defined as the coefficient of friction, abbreviated COF. More specifically, it is referred to as the static coefficient of friction, or SCOF, since it relates to a stationary object. If I tug sideways with a greater force than the uh, static coefficient of friction allows, the object begins to move and the resisting force goes down. There is less friction force between the moving object than there was with the stationary object, so the dynamic coefficient of friction is a lower ratio. The DCOF is smaller than the SCOF. The coefficient of friction is not a characteristic of a surface by itself, but a characteristic of two surfaces rubbing one on the other. A leather sole on a standard tile has a different coefficient of friction than a neolite tile, uh, sole on the exact same tile. Something wet between the surfaces also reduces the coefficient of friction, but as does most contamination, in particular dirt, mud, soap, oil, grease, and so on. What is the right value for friction? Well, many organizations relate to a COF value of 0 0.5 as a good figure. They just won't say what it's good for. There's a bunch of complicating factors. Uh, the, the, uh, we're going to talk about them now. The first is a ramp. And a ramp has an angle, and as you walk down the ramp, you normally stand straight up and down so that gravity works in your favor. But your feet adapt to the angle of the ramp. The friction force acts in the plane of the ramp to keep you on the ramp and is a fraction of the force perpendicular to the ramp. Your weight, however, is a force pointed straight down and only part of it is perpendicular to the ramp due to the angle. Since you are on an angle, a part of your weight also acts to push you down the ramp. Friction force counteracts this pushing force since the interface between your shoes and the ramp surface does not change the coefficient of friction is not changed. But the angle is reducing the percentage of your weight that acts down through the coefficient of friction to provide the friction, re friction force, which is keeping you on the ramp. Same coefficient of friction, less perpendicular force, results in less force keeping you from sliding off the ramp. Now let's make this ramp am angle steeper, and the part of your weight that is perpendicular to the ramp gets smaller, so the resisting force goes down, but now the interesting part. The component of your weight that pushes you down the rate ramp goes up as the ramp angle goes up. So as the angle increases, your pushing force gets larger, the resisting force gets smaller, and when they're equal, that's when you slip. Remember when your math teacher said you'd be sorry you did not pay attention in trigonometry? Well, it turns out that the tangent of the ramp angle, which makes you slip, is the coefficient of friction. All right, enough trigonometry. Stairs present an interesting situation because you introduce a new component of force into the situation. Going up, there is an increase in the dynamic loading of down force that you apply. And going down, the opposite can happen depending upon the speed that you are moving. Surface textures are used to increase the amount of friction on the interface, and among other things, they reduce the influence of water, since water has a place to hide between the peaks of the mating surfaces. Normally, it's good, but too much friction can cause shuffling feet to catch and lead to trip. I remember a particularly nasty fall, trip and fall, that left a gnarly skinned left palm on me for several weeks. The trip was caused by an extremely rough concrete surface that caused me to trip as I scuffed my running shoe and my center of gravity got ahead of my extended foot. 
the extreme friction caused both the trip and the injury. So then dirt, mud, soap, water, wax, and other materials quickly change, that is, reduce the coefficient of friction for both static and dynamic forces. Another thing is multi-material surfaces are commonly used to tip stair treads, providing increased friction, but again, they can lead to a trip situation either through increased friction or by creating a trip hazard for the added on material. So there's other factors, more factors to talk about. This is why it's complicated. As consultants, we provide information on causation and juries decide responsibility, but it's inevitable that any party to an incident may contribute to the reasons that a slip, trip, or fall occurred. For instance, I might have been more attentive when I mounted my bicycle to assure that the chain was actually moving. But because I could move the sprocket backwards, I got fooled. Or the manufacturer of the bicycle might have built a faulty derailleur on my 10 feet and, or placed the sprocket too far away from the frame, thereby allowing or providing for an entrapment area. The maintenance done on the annual maintenance visit may have maladjusted the derailleur, and the street might even have contributed since there's a pothole there that I had to avoid. Other, con other contributing factors are water, snow, ice, grease, oil, and contaminate. They can all be factors. So as mentioned uh, earlier, there are more than 90 devices that have been invented to measure friction. In terms of coefficient of friction, static coefficient of friction, dynamic coefficient of friction are replete in the literature, and they have specific meaning. Slip resistance is a term used but must be defined in the context as it seems to mean whatever the user wants, wants it to mean. And that's not a bad thing. It's just a caution. The ASTM, or the American Society for Testing the Materials, offers these four standards that are listed, and they're often mentioned in the literature. The drag sled tester, James machine, PIOS, or the portable inclinable articulated strut slip tester, and the VIT, or variable incidence tribometer, are referred to often in nearly any search that you do. The drag sled and James testers are some of the oldest standards still being referred to. The PIOS was developed about 30 years ago, and the, v, the VIT was developed in the early 1990s. These are referred to either as machines or instruments, and that depends a lot on your background. I'll use the terms interchangeably. So what are friction measurement considerations? These machines address aspects of the measurement of friction differently, and the differences are important in the values of coefficient of friction measured and reported. These factors are in addition to those mentioned already. Fiction, sometimes written with a K, at P I C K. To emphasize the word thick, relates to a quality of surfaces that are sitting together for a period of time. It's kind of like watching a football game. The longer you sit there, the harder it is to move. Anyway, I digress. Friction occurs because surfaces tend to relax and form mechanical bonds or grip between them. Breaking friction requires a force to break or dislodge these grips prior to the basic resisting forces taking over. So two surfaces that have just contacted together have less friction resisting force available than the same two surfaces which have sat in contact for, say, one minute. So what? Well, a foot moving in ambulation, or a foot in ambulation is moving in the direction of the surface, and as it contacts the surface, it has a motion relative to that surface. In order for it to stop successfully, it has to come into contact. The initial contact does not involve friction, but friction begins building immediately. So the force to cause slipping is less at that time than it is one minute later under the same circumstance. Seems we're having a little trouble with the microphone, so I'm going to get a little closer and speak up a little higher. The initial contact, uh, let's see. The force to cause slipping is less at that time than one minute later in the same circumstance. Therefore, a test that has a long contact time between the surfaces prior to the test will measure a higher coefficient of friction than one done immediately. Resonance time is the amount of time in contact and seconds count in this interaction. A, a tester that reduces resonance time may be more appropriate than one that does not if the issue is walking. Remember, I said appropriate, not accurate. It depends on the situation. 
Uh, the final note here is sample preparation. It's critical in all testing. All samples must be the same, and they must represent the incident that is under consideration. It makes no sense to use a leather heel pad if the incident it relates to a neolite heel. And repetition is critical. No single test is adequate. And repeated testing, commonly three tests, are used with the average coefficient of friction being the one reported. Of course, the standard deviation of the three tests should be calculated, and a high standard of deviation indicates that something is wrong and needs attention. ASTM standard 1028 relates to a specific drag sled using a 50-pound weight and an electronic force gauge. The maximum force hold feature is an important part of the gauge since it's difficult to maintain awareness of the highest force achieved, and human memory and eyesight alone will lead to increased standard deviation. The interface between the weight and the surface is according to the incident, or possibly to a particular standard that, for example, is testing standard tiles or a commercial tile when comparing to a standard tile. The test standard is only used for static dry fix friction. The instrument is popular since it's inexpensive, it's easy to carry if a smaller weight can be specified, and it's easy to use and very easy to explain to a jury. Many homemade versions of a drag sled are used. The James machine, shown here, both in the ASTM standard drawing and as it actually appears in the lab, is a lab machine since it is large and heavy. It cannot be on location testing to suit a particular situation. The white pad in the picture, that's here, is the test surface. And the black item on top of that white pad is the test foot. It's typically a 4x4 four four test material. The large round weight at the top, again here I'm pointing with the cursor, uh, is released and the table moves incrementally, thereby changing the angle of the connecting rod. The connecting rod being this rod between the pad and the weight. As described earlier, the perpendicular force on the pad decreases as the movement occurs. It decreases the available resisting force offered by the material interface between the pad and the test surface until the horizontal component of weight overcomes the resistance force. And at that point, a marker writing the graph pad on the vertical wall, and that's here in this pad, uh, draws a line on the paper. And that's best illustrated in the drawing here where you can see there is a sharp drop off on the graph line at the point in time where slip occurs. Interestingly, the tangent of the angle of the connecting rod, again here, is the numerical value of the coefficient of friction. The James machine is only good for static dry coefficient of friction, but it became a standard reference, and it's most often reference tester when other devices, patented devices, are trying to make their case. Robert Brungraber was a professor at Bucknell University in Pennsylvania who invented tree friction measuring devices. Interestingly, he donated the patents to the public trust for the good of humanity. The first is referred to as the Mark I, an instrument often used in bathtub measurements. The instrument shown is the Mark II, and a third instrument called the Mark III was developed. All have a noticeable similarity in design to the James machine. The Mark II addresses resonance time, is easily portable, provides for wet or dry static and dynamic coefficient of friction, and is the most frequently used of the three referenced in the literature. The flat pad on the front of the tester allows the operator to step on it, and I'm showing that here. That's this pad is basically for the operator to stand on the machine to stabilize it in testing. Uh, the machine is relatively lightweight, so it's required to do that, and if you don't do that, you can get a, a mal-reading. The angled slot allows, the angled slot here, where, where the uh, hand wheel is at, allows uh, for adjustment of the angle of, the, uh, of approach for a single test, and the angle is adjusted manually for successive tests until slipping occurs. 
And again, what you do is you drop the angle of the weight until you get to that point where you get equal friction and resisting force, or resisting force and horizontal load force, and that becomes the point at which slip occurs. So again, the tangent of the adjustment angle is, uh, at slip represents the coefficient of friction, and it may be referred to as the slip resistance of the situation tested. The English VIT is shown here. It is the most recently developed instrument, and it's similar to the Brungraber Mark II. It adds a pneumatic force, which is adjusted to a constant 25 psi pressure, providing a well-controlled load force. It is operated by switch and can be repeated rapidly, allowing for quick successive testing and makes that a convenient instrument. The foot on which one material is mounted is articulated and held at an angle such that the edge of the pad, this is the test pad or the test material, hits down on the test surface in a fashion similar to a heel of a foot striking during ambulation. As it hits, this pad articulates in the manner of a foot strike to become flat on the test surface, and thus this instrument mimics human ambulation to the greatest extent of any of the instruments. So now we're going to talk a little bit about some actual testing results. This slide depicts an actual test of tiles using a drag slit approach. The dry static friction was measured for comparison of textures. The basic panel is shown here on uh, two uh, courses. The uh, important part of any testing is shown in the lower left here, and that is that the test specimen is level. Friction can occur in, and does occur in every plane, but we use gravity as the force in drag sled testing, so levelness guarantees that we apply the weight correctly. The right panel here shows the electronic gauge with maximum force hold ability. So it will record the maximum force that's uh, maintained or held and required to cause the pad to slide. In this case, the load was about 25 pounds. Three measurements were made for each test and the average t uh, results recorded. The materials tested were crepe and naga hide. Note that this test is being made on the tile, whereas the results shown next were made across the grout line. So you can see right here the test pad is in the center of the tile. Another test was made across the grout line, and because the contact area is different, the results are lower. So for four tiles were uh, tested, samples A, B, C, and D. A is a grained uh, tile, as if sanding material were incorporated in the ceramic finish. B has this crisscross arch. C has uh, dots, which are further textured with a crosshatch on top. And D has a uh, point sharp points that uh, substantially uh, dig into whatever surface is applied to it if compliance is available. So the four tile data of dry co sta uh, static coefficient of friction shows that the uh, samples A, B, C, and D, and you see the le legend here, uh, range from 0.45 for sample B to 0.60 for sample D. So D provides 33% more slip resistance than B under the conditions represented. The values shown are lower than the measures, uh, the values measured when the foot was in full contact with the tile because these were the measures taken across the grout line. Another example is given by a steel worker study. This study was completed to measure and correlate steel worker safety when walking high steel beams. The Brungraber Mark II and the VIT were used or chosen to make the comparative measurements, and highly experienced steel workers were trained in methods to objectively report their feelings about the relative slipperiness of the coated beams that were tested. The workers wore their own shoes, all in good condition, but representing uh, either rubber type or crepe type heels and soles. Seven commonly applied beam coatings were tested for both wet and dry friction, and the results were interesting. The upper graph is for the Mark II, the lower for the VIT. While the amount of data here makes it hard to evaluate the test comprehensively in our short time, there are several notable points to make. The steel workers rated the slipperiness so that no coating could have the same value. Each coating was rated as either more or less slippery than another. The, the ratings were averaged, but surprisingly uniform. 
For my purposes, I have made their perception ratings range, ratings range from 0.1 worst to 0.7 best, and they're shown here on the green line. So that on both green lines on the Mark II and the VIT are for the worker perceptions. Coding C performed the best by perception and was best by Mark II, but second by the VIT. See the third point here on the chart. Codings A, B, and C all performed well, either wet or dry, and were measured with high coefficient of friction for both the Mark II and the VIT. Interesting, interestingly, the VIT measurements, the coding with significantly higher COF than the Mark II. Wet coefficient of friction performance was lower than average for DNF and markedly low for E and G. Pretty obviously, you want your money on A, B, or C when you're waking up in the early morning dew high up on a steel structure. So several points of understanding show up here that are beyond the intent of the test. Wet coefficient of friction testing is often where the most important testing is done. The difference between dry and wet friction often points out important changes in performance. The bottom line here is the final arbiter of good is the worker perception, not the coefficient of friction. But the coefficient of friction measurements validate the worker perception. One without the other is not as good. It's good news that the two instruments are available, which provide reasonable correlations with the reality of work life, but it's bad news the instruments don't show the same measurement for the same situation. And that is why there's a lot of controversy in this most common litigious situation. And finally, who wants .5 when your life is on the line? Okay, I've got two more slides. Uh, this trip, we're going to talk a little bit about trip standards. And uh, they're less controversial than the slip standard, so we'll be less involved in terms of what we have to talk about. A key trip standard was developed with the Americans with Disability Act in 1990, which was updated in 2008. Trip hazards exist when the surface takes an abrupt change in elevation up or down in an unexpected way. Uh, thresholds, piles, carpet edges, stairs, platform edges are all examples. The ADA established that uh, any level up to a quarter of an inch uh, is okay. But from a quarter of an inch to a half an inch, there needs to be a beveled surface connecting the two levels with a rise to run ratio of one to two, meaning that for every two inches of travel, the rise cannot exceed one inch. For levels greater than a half inch, a ramp defined by another part of the ADA standard must be used uh, for the ramp design. And talking about falls, uh, it's not the fall, it's the sudden stop at the end that gets you. So uh, we can't really talk about fall as a standard because uh, it's the law of gravity that controls when you're in the fall. We have to talk about how you prevent falls or how you minimize the damage they can do at the bottom of the fall. OSHA is an authoritative site for fall, uh, source of fall standard. There's a large section on falls on the OSHA website. And they, uh, they throw a wide net over any subject. They use, as usual, the devil's in the details. Uh, there's a list of specialized topics that are grouped, and as Mark pointed out earlier, uh, the general topic, uh, fall protection, safety, and health topics, is the first one. But shortly after that is construction fatalities, where the greatest number of fatalities occur, hospital e-tool, and then teen worker and restaurants, and we can all see the reasons for those. I won't go to an exhaustive list of guidelines, but uh, there are a number of things that can be stated that are obvious. Barriers can be up to 45 inches, but they can't cause obstruction for the work at hand. Handrails have to be available to the end. They have to extend to the limits of the stairs. Tread strips must be applied to some stair and ladder top. Stair height, depth, and angle have to be appropriate. Bed rails must be available on beds in hospitals. Water or contaminants on the floor must be monitored for and cleaned up as soon as found. And open drains and wet work areas must be fitted with mats or other devices for good slip resistance. Good practice recommends or demands that records be kept, and so you better find a convenient method. And as Mark says, first, design out the hazard, guard against it, and third, warn, warn, warn. And that brings us to the question list. Okay, excellent. And uh, Phil and Mark, if you can continue to speak closely to the microphone, uh, it would be greatly appreciated. I know some people are having some trouble hearing. Um, we have a question here from James who asks, if there are 90 devices that measure friction, can we challenge the use of a particular machine 
or pit one machine against another between experts? It certainly happens all the time. Uh, in fact, that's one of the big issues and one of the controversial parts of slip, trip, and fall. There are so many different machines and standards uh, that it is easy for one side to use one piece of equipment and another side to use a different piece of equipment. Uh, the coefficient of friction is what's measured in these devices or the resistance to slipping. And it's really the factors that are associated with the test that dictate which piece of equipment ought to be used or how those results uh, should be interpreted. As I pointed out in the steel worker study, uh, there was some conflict between the Mark II and the VIT, and there was also confirmation of both equipment with uh, the, the uh, perception of the workers. The workers' perception is, is pretty key. I think you need to go back to the basic issue and then correlate the numbers with that. Okay, excellent. Another question here that asks, is it possible to use one number for the appropriate coefficient coefficient of friction? The easy answer on that is no. There is no single coefficient of friction which satisfies all circumstances. Uh, all of the uh, intervening factors, the complicating factors that we talked about will change the number that's appropriate in a given situation. So it has to be evaluated within the context of that situation. Okay, we have a question here from Anthony who asks, what is the composition of the bottom surface of the drag sled. Does it vary to simulate the sole of a shoe of a slip victim? If not, how do you account for differences in the friction of the shoes they were wearing? You have to bring to bear the uh, materials that were involved in the situation to characterize the situation appropriately. There are also standards uh, that have been developed by, uh, for instance, by the Ceramic Tile Council and others for certain types of materials like leather or neolite on certain standard surfaces that give you a context for the evaluation of the number. But as far as I'm concerned, the number needs to uh, be related to the exact circumstances that are being evaluated. Okay, excellent. And one more question. Um, Phil, you, you discussed a couple standards um, during the, the, the section that just ended. Um, is one standard the best standard or the most closely followed standard? No, there is no one standard that is most closely followed. Uh, as I tried to point out in my uh, uh, conversation, the James machine provides the essential principle and, and also the drag sled, but the James machine seems to be pointed to more frequently in terms of uh, control and laboratory and experimentation. But remember the coefficient of friction is just a number, and there are so many other factors that contribute to uh, slip that uh, it is just one part of the evaluation of what occurred. Okay, excellent. I don't see any other questions in the queue. So one of, actually, I do have one question here from Sarah who asks, what is your opinion of the use of flagstone in high-traffic high areas such as in front of retail stores? Is there a suggested limit on how uneven the surface of stone can be? Well, yes, the ADA provides us with a good detail on that. The uh, difference in height of the flagstone, or particularly, as I understand flagstone, it's kind of a rough or a cobblestone type approach. Uh, those changes in height should not be greater than a quarter of an inch. And uh, in the circumstance of a small flagstone, uh, where you have kind of a rumble going on when you go over that, particularly if you're in a wheelchair, uh, I would suggest that, that good sense would uh, make it even less than a quarter of an inch. Okay, excellent. I don't see any other questions in the queue, so why don't we continue on with the presentation of content? Very good. This is, um, I'm Mark, and uh, back to uh, follow up now with uh, human factors aspects. Thank you, Phil. Um, human factors is a study of the interrelationships between humans, the tasks they perform, and the environments in which they live, work, and interact. Uh, it examines how individuals process information and looks for ways to reduce human error. I commonly describe uh, the science of human factors as designing products, tasks, and environments so that it's easy to be right and hard to be wrong. Human factors professionals typically use the hazard control hierarchy to analyze potential hazards. The hazard control hierarchy defines a sequence of approaches 
in order of preference for dealing with hazards. The basic sequence is to first design out the hazard, second is to guard against the hazard, and third is to warn that the hazard is present if it can't be designed out or guarded against. Regarding human factors, the personal characteristics that are important for both the plaintiff and the defense to consider include, but are not limited to, the individual's eyesight and visual perception. The age of the individual can be important because, as we discussed earlier, falls are the leading cause of injury-related death, death among adults 73 years old and older. Individuals who are obese fall almost twice as often when compared to non-obese individuals. Slips, trips, and falls are the most common cause of injuries for obese, obese individuals and account for 36% of all injuries for that population group. Risk perception and an individual's perceived consequences can increase an individual's likelihood of taking ill-advised risks or, or ignoring warnings. And finally, inattention or distraction can cause a person to not see a potential hazard or warning device. The individual's visual field and ability to perceive a potential hazard is an important aspect of slips, trips, and falls. If an individual is not able to perceive a hazard, they cannot take the appropriate actions to avoid the hazard. An individual has a relatively narrow window in which they have good visual acuity. We basically have a 15 degree cone where we have an optimal field of view. Anything outside that range is degraded to some extent. Therefore, it's important to create environments which accommodate our visual strength. As previously, as previously stated, if we cannot design out or guard against the hazard, then we should place warnings, um, place a warning uh, where it be, can be seen with our limited visual field. In this example from a case I was asked to analyze regarding the human factor aspects that lead to a fall and subsequent injury. The photo was taken in an auditorium type environment um, the floor is made of wood slate and is common for the light to be very low and dim in this environment. You see the wood slate um, continuing running, running all in the same, same direction. Site inspection revealed that the fall occurred in a location where the elevated platform wood planking runs in the same direction as the main floor planking. Identical floor patterns in conjunction with the, the individual's na uh, natural visual plane creates a situation where it may be difficult to identify changes in the grade in the situation, especially if the individual is engaged in conversation and not giving full attention to the task of walking. Shadows and similar color uh, colorations in flooring and ge 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 not, <laughs> geometric shapes can um, also make it very dif difficult to notice ground inconsistencies or changes in elevation. When considering um, and analyzing a slip, trip, or fall, it's important to consider the biomechanical, physical, and human factor aspects of the incident. We spent the majority of the presentation to this point discussing how slip, trips, and falls occur how they can be quantified with principles of biomechanics, physics, and human factors. Um, it's important to note that there are many things that can be done to prevent slips and falls as well, slips, trips, and falls as well. The first step is to identify any hazard that may exist. As with all safety-related hazards, plan for safety and monitor for results. Particular attention should be given to housekeeping, guards and railings and other protective barriers, proper floor materials, proper footwear, warnings, and visual cues. We'd like to thank uh, both Phil and I. We'd like to thank you for your time today and uh, answer any questions that you guys might have. Okay, thank you guys so much. And uh, for all the attendees out there, if you have any questions, uh, please submit them.
uh, through the chat feature or the Q&A feature uh, to our presenters. Um, Mark and Phil, there are a couple questions in the queue that I would like to get to. Um, you guys have discussed a lot of instruments that can be used to um, investigate uh, a slip and fall accident. Um, is there an instrument that you guys would say is the best instrument or are each unique and as they um, help you measure a certain aspect of the uh, of the accident? My opinion on that is that the instrument has to be chosen after the situation has been well defined. The uh, Some of the instruments, for instance, the VIT is uh, very much oriented at slips, uh, human slips, and that's ambulation uh, going on because uh, of the design of the machine. They put a foot on it that ambulates or, or uh, rotates uh, as it comes into contact uh, as it comes down, and it's intended to simulate a uh, human foot slip. Uh, but there are all kinds of slip measurements, and uh, people can slip, for instance, in the bathtub, just standing up and shifting their center of gravity. So literally, they're not, uh, they're not stepping. They're simply shifting their center of gravity and slipping. That might require a different uh, piece of equipment than uh, the VIT. Okay, excellent. Thank you. And um, a question that just came in um, from Carol asked, you've not mentioned anything about stairways. Uh, or you very rarely mentioned uh, about stairways. Uh, can you discuss uh, what happens in stairways and why trips and falls in stairways are so common? Uh, certainly. This is this is Mark. And... Um, Stairways provide, um, basically give us uh, several different scenarios that, um, that, that go on. I mean, you have a change in elevation, um, and the change in the elevation makes, a, um, obviously, a person more prone to actually um, maybe sustain an injury that um, may not have occurred uh, if, if it happened on, on level, if it, was, if it was a fall to the same surface, basically. Um, but in stairways also, um, many times you have contributing factors such as not only changing grade, um, but you also have lighting issues, um, things like that. Um, one of the, one of the um, most, um, I guess you could say, highest risk factors for stairways is actually deviation in riser, um, riser heights and where um, it kind of lends itself a little bit to the misstep issue, which the individual is perceiving a, a height of a certain level and that height doesn't, um, isn't met. And so it causes the person to, to um, basically lose balance, um, which in a, a stairway situation, um, it's more, more difficult for an individual to compensate for that loss of balance and, um, and basically regain, regain balance. I have two cents on that. Uh, last year I fell down a flight of stairs. That's 14 steps. I counted every one on the way down. And therein lies, uh, well, there's several aspects of it. First of all, I was barefoot. It was about midnight, so I'd been working all day. I was tired. Uh, I, uh, the carpeting on that is a nice plush carpet. And uh, when I stepped on the end with my heel, I just didn't have enough uh, support. And I slipped right off. But I didn't, I didn't just slip. I actually fell all the way down the stairs on my rear end. And uh, so consequently, I could uh, experience it all the way down and think about how dumb I was to have done that in the first place. So it's not just the slip. It's not just the first fall. It's the 14 bounces thereafter that broke my little toe and tore my rotator cuff. So uh, there's a lot of things that are involved. I also snagged my arm, which I had a good hold on the railing, but uh, it turned out I lost that grip and got a hold of a relatively sharp corner on, a, on one of those uh, nice turn balustrades that I've got, and I took a big chunk out of my arm. So, you know, there's a lot of other factors associated with uh, stairs. Another thing, uh, it, it, particularly in work situations, is uh, snow and ice and water will be treaded in from just outside to just inside and then commonly down a set of stairs. And uh, so, consequently, there's a, an exaggerated hazard there, and all the same things that I just discussed in my home. The um, there are there are a few statistics that I can I can uh, just touch on. Um, obviously, most and this this probably won't be a shock, but most 
um, falls and stairways occur from uh, descent as opposed to um, ascending. And um, statistics show that 75% of the falls occur with women as opposed to 25 with men. And there might be some um, some factors there that um, relate to footwear as well. Um, and then um, public versus private stairways, um, it's around a high 60% that are in public versus private. And so, um, which can go to an individual, uh, many of the human factor issues such as perception. Um, typically, the, per the more knowledgeable a person is of an environment, the more aware they are of the hazards that might be present. Um, however, a, a person can um, become too comfortable with their environment, and when a hazard is present, they're, they're inattentive to that change, which can also predispose them. I mentioned earlier as well that uh, there's a dynamic aspect of going up and down stairs. And when you're going upstairs, you're lifting yourself. There's a dynamic force that's applied that gives you a greater traction. When you're going downstairs, depending upon how fast you are going, uh, there's actually a, a reverse dynamic to that in that you don't actually touch down with the same force your entire weight uh, before you're moving on to the next stair. And so less weight down, less traction. Okay, excellent. I don't see any other questions in the queue. So uh, we have one from Alan that just came in, and as I was saying that, I apologize, Alan. Um, Alan asks, how do bare feet compare to footwear relative to the risk of slipping? The uh, bare feet are much more prone to slipping. Uh, you've got a nice uh, flat surface. Uh, the good thing is that it's compliant, so if there is any texture in the uh, surface that you're walking on, you've got a better chance of getting a mechanical grip. That's that resonance time issue that we talked about. And going back to those four tiles that I showed in the static coefficient of friction test, uh, that was the issue. We had a barefoot uh, fall on uh, a tile, and we were looking at alternative tiles that would have provided more friction than the one that was used. Okay, excellent. I now, um, we have answered all the questions in the queue, so I will now wrap things up. Um, Phil and Mark, thank you so much for the time and the effort that you put into this presentation. I think we all learned a lot about slip trips and falls. Um, if anybody in the audience would like to speak to Phil and Mark about a case, you can contact us here at CAFA, number is 800-523-2319. We'll be sending out a link to the archived recording of this webinar tomorrow morning. This webinar, as well as all of our previous webinars, um, are posted in the Knowledge Center of TAPS's website. To get to that, visit our homepage, www.tapsnet.com, and click on Knowledge Center at the top of the screen. Our next client-focused webinar, Leading Causes of Railroad, Pedestrian Accidents, and, industry, and Injuries, will take place on November 9th at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. If you have any questions or comments, please email me at mhyde at tapsnet.com. Again, that's mhyde at tapsnet.com. We do take all of your comments, and they help us put on better programs. So please do feel free to comment me, comment to me at any time. With that, I will end today's program, and we look forward to seeing you at future TAFSA events.